Griner Talks about sustainability and transformation. A Griner podcast episode. This is Griner Talks, our podcast about sustainability and transformation. How to save our planet and how to save its wildlife. We are not discussing casual topics. That is why I have invited a pretty special guest today. And I'm sure many of you know this young gentleman, especially if you're from the German speaking part of the world. He is a marine biologist, he is a scientific diver, and he's definitely an adventurer. He has done expeditions in more than 100 countries on all continents of this planet. He's one of the world's top wildlife photographers. He has written a best-selling book about his journeys and he's running a pretty popular YouTube channel. But most importantly, he's fighting for animals and for their habitat. Hi and welcome Robert Mark Lehmann. Thank you for the invitation. It's good to be here. Thank you, Robert. I had a pretty tough time introducing you uh, <laughs> because after watching many of your videos, reading your book, I mean, You're diving with sharks, you're rescuing orcas, you're fighting wildlife trade in the Philippines, or you're just trying to survive somewhere in the world. It's pretty hard to put that into words. That is actually correct. And I'm struggling all the time with this typical elevator pitch where you have to describe yourself and your job within 12 seconds. That's just not possible with my job. Excuse me. <laughs> so for our listeners, can you give us an elevator pitch? Ah, this is really, really complicated. As you said, from, from my studies here, from the education, I am a marine biologist. That is correct. I studied that and forensic medicine, by the way. Apart from that, I did my scientific diving course and I became supervisor of scientific diving. And this is what I do most of the time in, when it comes to research, research underwater in terms of real science. Then I work as a photographer and filmmaker, so I handle cameras on a regular basis in, uh, let's say, harsh environments. And I am an adventurer because adventurer means uh, research something, putting yourself out of your comfort zone. And this is what I do on a regular basis in terms of conservation issues. So basically the biggest issue I face is conservation. And I would like to describe myself as kind of a conservation topic content creator, maybe something like that. It's a new job description, <laughs> I guess. You have already mentioned science, you've mentioned research, conservation, and that's many of the topics that I would like to discuss with you later on. But when I watched some of your videos, I saw you diving next to sharks and I just want to know how does that feel diving next to a giant shark to observe one of these beautiful animals from such a short distance? I mean, for me, this was a childhood dream and it became suddenly real. And I was reading all these books on sharks, rays and ghost sharks for, for basically my whole life. And then being in the water the first time with a huge shark, like like a great hammerhead shark, which is like five meters or a tiger shark, which is six meters. It is for me the best feeling you can have in the world. It's for me the most intense moment. It's not about adrenaline. It's about respect and appreciation for nature. And I'm very, very glad that I'm able to do this, like physically and, and uh, from the monetary side of things and uh, that I can take images and films which in the end protect these animals I, I love from the bottom of my heart. And for me, these are the best things you can do in your life, diving with sharks. I mean, many people, they, they want to swim with dolphins or dive with dolphins. For me, I want to swim and dive with sharks. <laughs> and five times in your life, you got bitten by sharks. For people yeah. like me working in an office, that's quite unusual <laughs> and it seems a little bit scary. How did that happen and why are you not changing your job? <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I still have my fingers, my arms and my legs. Everything is still attached. And uh, the situations I got bitten in, uh, they were provoked. And these were the times I was uh, catching sharks, actually, because I, I worked as an animal collector for zoos and aquariums worldwide. So I was actually catching sharks and sometimes they fight back. But these times are long gone and uh, far from the things I do nowadays, because I basically changed my whole life around 180, maybe 360 degrees. <laughs> the world is worth fighting for. 
that's written on the cover of your book. It's called Mission Erde, Mission Earth. And you're also running a nonprofit organization with the same name. Now you have already told us your life has changed quite a lot. I want to know what are you fighting for and what's your what's your mission? This quote is actually from Ernest Hemingway. And besides his like uh, hunting skills and big game fishing stuff, he was a, a big appreciator of, of nature and, and animals. And I really like that quote because from the things I have seen in more than 120 countries now, on all continents, from Antarctica to Arctic, from, from New Zealand, which is amazing, to the South American jungles. I've seen so m many beautiful things and so many, excuse me, fucked up situations where, where uh, rainforest is destroyed or where illegal wildlife trade is, is an income. Um, our world is worth fighting for. And this is what I stand for and all the people working with me because it's so beautiful, I tell you. It's so cool to be out there diving with sharks or, or seeing polar bears in their natural habitat or standing on top of a mountain or somewhere uh, snorkeling around in a river in the Amazon. It is such a beautiful planet and I really, really want to preserve this, not just for me. It's, it's kind of a selfish thing, of course, because I like it so much, but uh, I want to preserve this planet and all these habitats for all the people in the world, even for the assholes. They deserve it as well. This is what I always used to say. <laughs> you are describing many amazing moments, many things that you have seen in your life. And I think if you had the chance to experience something like that, you have even more motivation to protect it. Was there one moment in your life, in your upbringing, in your youth that, that stands out for you, that made you follow that path? Oh, very good question. But I think it was my whole youth because I grew up and um, I was born in 1983. And these were the generations where we, we did not have internet or TV or, or cell phones or anything. So um, my whole youth basically yeah, was nature, being out there, being in the woods, playing in the woods, riding BMX bikes and fishing and snorkeling and stuff like that and uh, my grandfather that he took me in the woods he, he showed me everything he he and me we, we did our first uh, bonfire to, together and um, i used my first knife with him and these were the times i really look back to because he showed me how to appreciate nature and how to appreciate all these beautiful moments out there and this is still in my heart and i really wish that young people, young adults, whoever they are or wherever they live, that they can experience the same youth as, as I did. But this is just not possible as we live in a very fast and uh, vast changing world at the moment. And I don't think this is a good thing for, for a young mind, for a young brain. So I, I highly recommend to go outside more often, as much as you can. <laughs> Some years ago, I had the incredible pleasure to speak to an indigenous leader from Brazil. And he said that we are losing connection to nature totally. And that creates many problems. Do you agree? 100% agreed. I, I talk to indigenous uh, leaders in the Brazilian Amazon rainforest as well. I live with them. And yeah, I see it the same way. And you know p young young childs and adults they they know who pikachu is but i don't they don't know what a badger is and this this is really frightening me f from the bottom of my heart because yeah we lost connection long time ago actually and i'm trying to bring that back and the funny thing is or the good thing people reconnect with with my youtube channel the book i wrote and everything i i have the sense that people think wow, this is so cool what this guy does. I want to do the same thing. And this is the, the best thing you can actually tell me. I want to do the same. Yes, absolutely. Go ahead, study, become a marine biologist. You don't even have to. Become a diver, become a bushcrafter, whatever it is. Just go outside, enjoy nature, and then try to protect it because it's, it's worth fighting for. And this is exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. I'm curious. National Geographic has awarded you as Photographer of the Year, I think in 2015, and you're doing all these amazing photos and videos. Do you think that can help us to reconnect with nature or do we just have to go out there? I mean, 
Yeah, <laughs> this is exactly why I'm doing this. And because I, I, I could just go into nature and appreciate it by myself, but bringing back all these images and films to inspire people, this is exactly why I do it. And I'm always searching for people who are unknown. Their stories, they are untold. And this is exactly what I'm doing, going there and, and live with these people, connect with these people, and then at the end, tell their story. So people can rely and relate to these people and yeah, maybe do the same thing. And even if it's, if it's the smallest thing, like a Dorf rescue station in Germany, somewhere in the backyard, or, or people who are castrating cats, which is not a NGO uh, money income uh, donation thingy, but it's very important when it comes to conservation. So um, I really like to, yeah, give people the chance who are unknown and then other people can take them as yeah as a as a role model kind of thing and do the same thing and in your book you're saying that you're more closely connected to animals than to human beings 100% very difficult to imagine for me but i want to ask you why is it so incredibly difficult for these two for animals and humans to coexist peacefully because i can't talk and talking is the most important thing that you discuss things that you talk to each other that you yeah talking is the most important thing and what i'm trying with my films and the images and the stories i tell is giving all these animals a voice because if fish for example could cry or scream or shout nobody would catch them anymore or would treat them the way we do at the moment i mean just an example uh, fish is the most consumed animal in the whole world one billion fish get consumed every single day and they they die a horrible way in terms of being squeezed in a net or they they suffocate out of the water and nobody talks about this and within the last 10 years scientists researchers found out that they do feel pain like we do that they do have a conscious thinking that they do feel love that they have partners that they feel stress and imagine i always think in like an empathic way i try to connect with these animals and uh, there's a saying from uh, Jacques Cousteau, if you want to study fish, you have to become a fish. And this is really what I'm trying to do. And then I can tell the story at the end. And sometimes uh, people think, wow, yeah, I didn't know that. I, I have to change my life and I don't eat fish anymore because now I understand. This is a very important sentence for me to, to hear. Now I understand. Thank you. I just love that saying, by the way. Yeah, it's, it's a great saying, is it? And you're touching on, on a topic that is so important. And I think we are not talking about it enough. And it's a loss of biodiversity. You yes. just mentioned how much fish we eat on a single day. And I think that we're not talking about loss of biodiversity so much because it, it is not featured in news as prominently. It's not as prominent as climate change, as the pandemic, as something that is really threatening us right now, immediately. Can you tell us from a scientific point, why is biodiversity decreasing so rapidly and why is that such a big problem for us? Could be actually our biggest problem in the future because it's totally overlooked. When I started studying biology in 2003, it was totally like out of fashion to research species or to become an expert in, in, in species and, and biodiversity. Everything was uh, focused on the small stuff and DNA, RNA and cancer research and stuff like that. But we lost sight in terms of species. And now we are, we are facing one of the biggest extinction happenings in the whole world this planet has ever seen. We're losing 150 different species of just animals every single day. 150 species, totally unknown, never seen, every single day. And I'm not just talking about small flies or worms or some deep sea creatures. It's also rhinos or tigers or whatever. And if you look at the numbers for, for large mammals, like tigers, rhinos, elephants, lions, whatever, they could face extinctions within the next 15 to 20 years, which is rapidly fast. We lost orangutans, for example, 70% in the last 20 years. I cannot imagine a world without orangutans or rhinos because 
all of these species, these iconic species, I'm just talking about these iconic species, they have a role in our ecosystems. Sometimes we don't know it yet. We, I, I don't know what the role of a Sumatran rhino in the Sumatran jungle is, but I don't want to find out what was the role when we, when we faced extinction in terms of rhinos there. And for some of these species, it's already too late. Take the vaquita, for example, there's just 12 of them left. They face extinction most likely this year. Sumatran rhinos, 79 left. It's one of my favorite animals. And um, it could actually happen that they, they go extinct within my lifespan. And this would be highly devastating. And these are just the iconic species we see. And then there's so much more species going on in a deep sea, somewhere hidden in the jungle, in the sand, in the air, whatever. And they go extinct without us even knowing them and their role in the ecosystems. And just an example everyone can relate to. Like 30 years ago, when I was driving on the Autobahn with my parents for like going on holidays or vacations, we had to stop every 100 kilometers to get all these insects from our window shield. And uh, this you don't have to do anymore. They are gone. I want to talk to you about another big problem as well that is very much connected to this. That's pollution, pollution of the environment, and especially, I mean, Kreiner is a plastic producing company, pollution of the seas, of the ocean, marine littering. And you are a diver. Can you tell us as a scientific diver, how bad is the situation? Do you encounter plastic waste on every single dive? Yeah. Very bad. The situation is very bad. Whenever I go diving, it doesn't matter if it's a lake, a stream, a river or the ocean, I find plastic every single dive I'm doing. It depends on the year between 100 and 200 dives every single year in all climate zones. If it's the Philippines or if it's the Baltic Sea for research, there's plastic everywhere. No dive without plastic all the time. If it's plastic bottles, if it's fishing nets, they are made of plastic as well. If it's plastic parts from boats or just unidentified plastic parts, it's plastic everywhere all the time. And even on my way to the dive sites and on the way back, there's floating plastic parts on, mm -hmm. on the surface mm -hmm. of the ocean. I mean, the ocean is not full of plastic on the surface, but I, I find uh, plastic parts on a regular basis. And this worries me very much because it doesn't go away for a very long time and it pollutes not just pollutes the ocean it creates large problems because of the things which are included in plastic like phthalates or softeners from from the ancient times or all these whale strandings or struggling turtles or animals um yeah entangled in, in nets it creates so many problems and i actually think plastic pollution is right next to climate change and loss of biodiversity, one of the biggest issues we actually have to start really, really, really to start fighting against. I mean, we are producing plastic packaging as one of many things. We are producing yogurt cups, plastic bottles and, and all of these things. And of course, we do not put them in the rivers and in the oceans, but probably some of our products end up there as well. How can we change that? How, what can we do to stop marine pollution? Yeah, this is exactly what you said. It doesn't make sense to, to go out on the ocean and, and collect all the plastic because this is something people on, on this point, I, I disappoint a lot of people because they, they donate to these ocean cleanups and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What you can actually get out of the ocean, pick up from the surface is just 1% of the plastic in the ocean. 99% is already within the water column or somewhere in the animals or sunken down to the deep sea. So you can't get it out anymore. The most important thing is to prevent plastic from getting into the ocean. So you have to concentrate on rivers. Actually, there's lots of rivers bringing plastic into the ocean and this is where you, you need to concentrate. But I like to start before. It's, it's in terms of how do you handle plastic? What people sometimes misunderstand, plastic is bad. This is not the case. It's certain plastic is bad or how you handle plastic is bad. Plastic itself is not bad. So um, as a plastic producing company, I would like to to urge you to, to search for other solutions 
for non-toxic solutions for our environment, for reducing packaging, for being more sustainable. But the good thing is that more and more companies like your company, they understood. And there, there we are at the point from the beginning, most important thing, I understand. I understand and now I can solve the problem. This is the most important thing. We don't have to wiggle around the problem. We have to find a solution. And this is, if companies like yours, it makes me very happy that you guys are yeah, in the game, supporting the fight for our planet. I also believe that understanding is, is a very important first step, but taking action is probably even more important. And at least from my perspective, sometimes things are happening too slow because it is a Same huge here. system and it's so difficult to change things. Do you have any advice that you can share from, from your expeditions, from your experience? <laughs> I see it the same way. I'm, I'm very impatient. I like to drive 250 kilometers an hour in, when it comes to conservation and all the solving these issues, you know? I like to be quick and fast, but sometimes you just can't. So uh, patience is something I, I, I can't rely to because I see the rapid changes. I see the rapid loss of biodiversity, the rapid pollution going on, the rapid loss of, of jungles. We really, really have to do something very fast. I would say the next 10 to 15 years are our most important years when it comes to saving this planet. And we all have to take action. And I know in democracies like the countries we live in, actions they take time when it comes to policy and something look this is 50 percent which is which comes from policies and companies and democratic decisions and stuff like that but the other 50 percent it's you it's your consumption it's your family it's it's your impact on the planet and you can change it now within a second you can change it exactly now you know now and you can change it now so be fast, be quick, because it's it's urgent. Our Let's say our house is on fire. Seriously. And I think that's a very good point that it might be difficult to change a system, but each one of us can take an action right now. Absolutely. So one or two things that you would advise our listeners to do right now, today? In terms of plastic or in terms of everything? Everything. Anything that comes to your mind. This was actually the, 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 the end point of my book because I, I finished the book and I said, well, okay, now they have read the book. What do they do? They may be searching for tips or inspiration, what they can actually do. So that's why I wrote 40 or 40 or something uh, sentences. This is what you can do. And the biggest impact you can actually have on our planet is your consumption when, when it comes to food. So, I don't urge you to, to eat less or, or to just eat vegetables, but eat very conscious, eat very sustainable. Take a look at your food, maybe change your, your way of buying food. This could have actually a very big impact. Keep on driving your car, but maybe next time buy another car or, or search for other solutions to, to get somewhere or when you drive a car, maybe compensate the CO2 it produces with buying rainforests, which actually preserves habitats which are okay. So, or maybe take the train. Maybe take the train. I like to take the, the train because then I can work when there is internet. <laughs> and yeah, plant trees as much as you can. There's so many, so many things that we can do. Yeah, and you know what? It's, it's super fun to learn about these things because you start somewhere changing your mind, changing how you buy food, but then you realize, okay, where do I have my bank account? Okay, my bank account actually has an impact on our planet. Maybe I should change that. Where do I get my power from, my, my energy? Maybe I should change the company. So you discover actually dozens, maybe hundreds of things you can actually change to have a lower impact on our planet. And this is the goal for everyone. And, and let me tell you something. It's never bad to change something for more being sustainable. It's always a good thing and it's fun. It's good for you, for your health and for our planet at the end. So I don't see any argument to not doing this. So I want to ask you, are you hopeful for the future of our planet? I am. I am. Because sometimes, yeah, people, they, they do ask me, Robert, after all the things you have seen, after all the things you have done, why do you still have hope? And 
let me be honest. Sometimes I lose hope. There's these days, like, I don't want to get out of bed because everything is shitty and then expedition gets canceled or some, some things, they just don't work out or the animal dies or whatever. I can't do anything. But I met so many people like the orca researcher Ingrid Visser, like Eric Ritter, the, the shark researcher, and many, many people more trying to fight for our planet. And even the, the rhino protection unit, guys somewhere hidden in the jungle, no one has ever heard of them, but they are trying to fight for the last 79 Sumatran rhinos. They're giving their lives for them. And whenever I meet people like that and being around people like that, I get hope again every single time. Thank you so much for, for that optimistic ending. And yeah. thank you for that amazing conversation, Robert. But before <laughs> I let you go, I'd like to invite you to do a short word wrap with me, if that's fine for you. I don't even know what that is, but I'm in. <laughs> I'm sure you'll figure out. It's just, you will get one word, one term from me, and you can reply with whatever comes to your mind. Okay. It can be only one word. It can be a sentence, a story, whatever. Check. Understood. Cool. So the first one, wildlife. Most important thing. Whale watching. You should do, but very conscious Koru ah, one of my favorite orcas and the first orca I rescued in my life he's yeah a very special animal and still alive your schedule um, it's basically 45 to 48 hours a day <laughs> it is seriously crazy I sleep way too less and I work way too too much but As I told you, it's for me. It's it's not just a job, or it's it's my life, and it's it's very short. And I want to do everything, you know. Reminds me of a story from your book, losing weight. Yeah, lots of times, and I'm trying to gain weight at the moment because I have three very harsh expeditions lined up for this year, and I want to go in as fat and as fit as possible, as I always say. So the goal is 80 kilos. At the moment, I'm struggling, 77, but I'm getting there slowly. All the best for that. Yeah, thank you, man. <laughs> <laughs> Your best photo ever taken? Maybe... The Grey Seal, which made me National Geographic Photographer of the Year. This is maybe my most beautiful photo, but the most impact I ever had with the photo is the five small orangutans holding onto each other, which are, yeah, which, which changed my life and the life of many, many people because it made people aware of the palm oil uh, issues. And yeah, this, this is maybe for me my most important image. Next one, plastics. Big problem, used in the right way, not a big problem. Our planet. Uh, just one, we should actually fight for it. <laughs> no, no, no plan B, no second chance. And last but not least, your message to the world. It is so beautiful, start fighting for it because it's worth it. That would be my message. Thank you so much, Robert. That was really, really cool speaking to you. Likewise, man. Highly appreciated. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Make sure to read Robert's book, check out his YouTube channel, check out his documentary, support his nonprofit Mission Erde, sign the Sharkfin campaign. Have a fantastic day and stay safe. Griner Talks, a Griner podcast. Subscribe now.